Good morning. Good morning. It is good to be with God's people this morning. And uh, I trust that you are blessed, blessed enough to be here, and that you will be a blessing to others. Um, it's always noticeable that <coughs> Beth and Walt aren't here. Uh, I hope they're okay. No, 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 no word on that. Okay. Um, Your truck was gone this morning when I left. <laughs> what's that? Your truck was gone when I left. Okay. All right. Well, um, we will pray that they are either uh, blessed and and cared for by the Lord <coughs> as they are visiting somewhere, or uh, that if something is the matter, that God will take care of that as well. <coughs> Well, we have a number of announcements here listed in our bulletin, and uh, let's see, on my list of those to just emphasize a bit, spaghetti dinner at 11 o'clock, I mean, excuse me, spaghetti dinner on March 11th, and then the Mother's Day tea on April 30th, uh, t tickets are available to both, and uh, the purpose of the tickets is so that we can know when we've filled the room. And so, uh, if you'd like your reservation, please uh, pick up tickets. Debbie has them with her today, and uh, Mr. King probably always has some with him uh, for the men's uh, spaghetti dinner. Um, I want to give you an update on the uh, platform, and that's uh, our event platform that's across the road that you know, had for a long time. It was hurriedly restored with plywood, uh, two years ago when we needed to be able to worship and give people enough fresh air and space to be careful about the new virus that we didn't know enough about at the time and that we did but we did know it was dangerous so um, the trustees have approved an idea and made a plan and are uh, uh, putting things in place to replace the plywood with decking uh, and instead of wooden material, the synthetic boards that are being used for um, making decks and docks and so on, um, it will be able to be a little bit wider from front to back. It will have a trim around the bottom to hide the underneath and make it look very nice. Um, they're planning to make a safety rail around it uh, that would include some cables across between the top rail and such. And um, improved stairs that are more to code and safer. Probably it sounds as though from the back there will be two staircases coming up on each end of the back so that people can come and go from either end and not be waiting or passing. And then uh, steps in the front so that if we have an outdoor wedding, I'm going to say when we have an outdoor wedding, people like to do that these days, um, the bride and, and the father of the bride or whoever is presenting the bride can come right up the front and onto the platform. Um, the plans are all worked out, the pricing is all worked out, and the expectation is that they'll be able to tear things down, clean up the framework, level it, uh, and, and build, do all of that it needs to be built before we get to the date of March 27, uh, so that we can have that platform. Now, the only thing that remains is we don't want to spend a part of the money that's uh, already needed to go to ministry that we're doing, and we don't want to get a loan. But it's been calculated that we'll need $3,000 to do the work with materials, and that would include running the electricity from where the water pump is to the platform underground so that uh, we're not putting out extension cords all the time. So it'll be safer, it'll be more beautiful, and uh, more functional, and last for a much longer time. Uh, so the invitation is that those who can would give something extra, beyond what you usually give, towards the project. And, uh, and that will be for future opportunity that when we have events here, it will be a more attractive thing and hopefully we'll draw some folks that want to be married here as well. Um, and that takes me to the last one, Save the Date. John and Kate Music Ministry were scheduled a year ago to be here with us this March on the 25th, which was a Friday, um, with 
uh, much consultation through a good number of our church leaders, it was realized that uh, that a Friday night was not the best time, and we switched over to that Sunday afternoon. John and Kate gave me the options of uh, either any Friday of March or, uh, of course, that particular Sunday, um, because they're only going to be in Florida in March. So we've made that adjustment, and as it turns out, that has meant that we were able to invite Mark Brinkman, known as Brink, who did the concert for us in the Praise Center just a couple months ago, to be there as well. So John and Kate will be here at 1 o'clock. Mark Brinkman probably will do a performance around 3 o'clock, uh, or maybe 2.30, and then a third musical group that we've been connected with is uh, John Barnett, Jeremy. who is doing... Jeremy. Jeremy, thank you. Jeremy Barnett, who is doing Glory Days, uh, I mean, that's a restaurant, the Glory Ranch, uh, having tent revivals over there, a young man uh, has said that, that he was certain that he would be able to bring the praise band that he uses when they have a revival. Uh, and so that means our uh, opportunity to have a concert in March has turned into an opportunity to have a um, spring music festival, spring Christian music festival. Three different groups with three different styles of Christian music, um, and so it's now an event. Um, rather than having our folks do uh, buying of food and cooking and all of those <coughs> things, um, we've gone the route of looking into some restaurants and, and or catering business and food trucks to come and provide food so that people can come and stay as long as they want. And so they may come at 1, or they may come at 3, or they may come at uh, 5.30 uh, for the different things, or stay for all of them. And, and it, uh, it's just exciting to me to see that God has lined those things up as a possibility for us. Um, so that's what it's shaping out to be on March 27th. And, and, uh, and it talks about an Easter celebration. So it's, it's a little bit before Easter, but, but it's that, that time of year. Okay, um, are there any other announcements that we need to bring up? All right, thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is a comforting thing to come into your sanctuary, a place with much memories, a place where you have made holy because of the things that you have done here as you have come to meet with men and women, boys and girls. We thank you, Lord, for the, the uh, holy experiences that we have had in recent years and in many years back in this place. We thank you, Father, that uh, we continue to experience your presence with us as we gather together. Partly because of where we gather, but also because of with whom we gather. We gather with others of like-minded purposes, seeking to know you, God, and to follow in your way. We come as a group of those who know that we are sinners, but we are saved from our sin, the penalty of sin and the slavery to sin, and set free to be sons and daughters of God, to live our lives more and more in righteousness, that we might be a holy people for God. Work in us, O oh Lord, each of us, in the very particular ways that are needed in our lives this morning. Speak to us through your written word and speak to us through your spoken word as the pastor attempts to apply the scriptures of long ago to the very valid purposes that God has for us today. By your Holy Spirit, speak to each person's mind and heart that we would apply your scripture to those 
particular needs in our spiritual lives and our physical lives. We ask these things in that powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So as I looked down, I saw a number, and I, I realized that I might not have said the amount. So for $3,000 is what is expected for the property uh, improvements across the road on the platform. And so uh, it's our intention to get started right away with whatever amount of money comes in uh, and move towards getting it complete. Uh, but hopefully we can have the $3,000 covered by many different donations uh, to be able to do that and not take money away from any of the other ministry areas. Okay. Our scripture and affirmation. The first scripture reading is from the book of Ezra, <clears throat> chapter 9, 5 through 15, Detestable Practices. At the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self abasement with my tunic and toque cloak torn, and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God and prayed. I am too ashamed and disgraced, my God, to lift up, lift up my face to you, because our sins are higher than our heads, and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our ancestors until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity to pillage and humiliation at the hands of foreign kings, as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia, he has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. But now, our God, what can we say after this? For we have forsaken the commands you gave, you gave through your servants, the prophets, when you said, The land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons, or take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time, that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt, and yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we then break your commands again and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? Lord, the God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it not one of us can stand in your presence. I invite you to stand as we share together in uh, the reading of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light. True God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, from him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sakes he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son has worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic Church, apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now I invite you to turn to hymn number 398, Jesus Calls Us. And as we return to you a portion of the monetary wealth that you have provided for all of our needs. And we are grateful that we are able to be a part of your blessing in the lives of others, in our community, in our, uh, the state of Florida, in our conference, and, and across the world. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would keep us focused on the other offerings that we are to bring, an offering of our time, our talents, our gifts, our services, our prayers. We ask, O oh Lord, that in so doing, that you would not only strengthen us in our spiritual walk with you, but that you would strengthen the work of your church in our community in bringing others to Jesus Christ, bringing them to you, to our Lord and Savior. We thank you for this privilege that it is to speak the word of your truth and to share the good news that others might turn from the brokenness of sin and be delivered from bondage to sin, that they might uh, truly be sons and daughters of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I've heard my people cry. All who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I, the Lord, who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? 
I, the Lord of snow and rain, I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They turn away. I will break their hearts of stone, give them hearts for love alone. They turn away. I, the Lord of wind and flame, I will tend the poor and lame. I will set a feast for them, my hand will save. Finest bread I will provide till their hearts are satisfied. I will give my life to them. My hand will say, Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I've heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you leave. I will hold your people in my heart. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. for the answers to prayer, for the unexpected blessings, and for continuing to care for us in so many ways. And with Alice, I join in prayers for her sister-in-law, Iris. We lift her up because of setbacks in her health, problems that she's now having with her kidneys and we ask the Lord that you would continue to strengthen her body and allow the natural healing to take place but where it seems that medical care and natural healing may be falling short we ask the Lord for your miraculous touch we see in the scriptures that Many times Jesus healed. And though there were times that he did not heal, <clears throat> though there was still death, and there was still sickness, and there was still brokenness and bondage for many in many situations, that when you came into the world to live among us, there was a lot of healing. And after the death of Jesus on the cross and, and the uh, resurrection, from the dead. Jesus continued to provide signs and wonders and miracles and that continued through his people. And so we lift up our prayers. We ask for physical healing. 
We also lift up the Merle Griffin family as she passed away on Tuesday the 15th. So we are reminded that death continues in this broken world, that you have not yet redeemed the physical world. And though you are currently redeeming our world spiritually, there are many who have not turned to you. We thank you, Lord, for your promise of deliverance from bondage to sin. Deliverance from bondage by Satan and his demons. And we understand that that is more important than the, the temporal aspect of deliverance from sickness or even from death. For we know that in Jesus Christ we have the opportunity to continue in spiritual life as well as to have a new physical life. And so most of all, I pray that you would help us to be your light in the world your witnesses in the world, your messengers that proclaim freedom from bondage to sin. We ask these things in Christ Jesus' name as we remember the prayer that he taught as a model for our prayers. <clears throat> our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we have a string of hymns that uh, are on a rope. A chain of hymns. A melange. Oh, there's a fancy word. I didn't know that one. A melange of hymns. And, um, but they are tied together very nicely for us here on the paper. And we're going to start on the side that says there's something about that name. And as I look at it, I see no instruction of how many verses to do. So, because most of them are short. Is That's it right. every verse, correct? It's every verse. Okay. So let's, uh, you're free to stand and sing or sit and sing, whichever will be most comfortable for you. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master. Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let the heaven and earth But there's something about that name. 
Satan has kept bound for 
18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her. When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. God's work for God's people. And now would you please join with me for prayer for our pastor. Father, thank you. Always thank you for the good and the bad, the sun and the rain, the cold and the heat. And especially thank you for Sunday when we lift our pastor to you, that he may feel your Holy Spirit flowing through him as he shares um, your insights from the scripture we all know. We thank you for this opportunity to be edified. We ask you to um, bless our hearts, our hearts with your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I need to start with a confession, and that is that um, I did the math real quickly in my head, and I exaggerated. Valerie is only two months older than I am. And uh, then also, um, when you're in a hole, don't dig. <laughs> when you're in a hole, don't dig. Quit digging. Okay. The important thing is she looks here, so I'm here. Well, that was, the, that was the also, and so you gave me permission to say it. When we were in Sebring, I was an associate pastor, and, and it was my second appointment in Florida after Joaquin and Wasissa, where we heard a lot of the Gaither songs uh, there on a regular basis. Um, but there was one Sunday that Valerie uh, played a, a special music piece on Sunday morning on her flute. And after church, one dear older lady, I was very young, we were both very young at that time, at least I thought I was young, but this uh, one lady said, I didn't know that your daughter played the flute. It was so beautiful. <laughs> so at the time, we did have, uh, let's see, Hannah was born in, at Lake Wales, right? Okay, so at the time, we had uh, three daughters and then a fourth one, and, uh, and yet... They, they thought Valerie was my daughter. And, uh, and so she, she has looked younger than me for many years, and I've acted younger than her for many years, so it, it balances out. Okay. Um, Careful. Lightning will strike you. The people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices. Verse 2. They have taken some of their daughters and wives for themselves and their sons and have for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the people around them. And the leaders and officials have led them, or have led the way in their unfaithfulness. This is a concern that was brought to Ezra's attention soon after he had arrived there in, uh, in, at, at, at Jerusalem. He was a part of the second wave of Jews who were allowed or, or encouraged really to, to go back to uh, Judea and to reestablish a temple for their God. Uh, the king of, uh, I guess you'd say, emperor of that empire of, of Babylon, Babylon at that time had come not only to respect but to believe about the king of the Jewish people, excuse me, about the God of the Jewish people. And he had such respect and, and belief about their God that he determined that 
they should go back and build a temple for their God in the place where God had established it. Now, I'm not saying that he was a follower of their God, but, but this is a big turnaround. He is sending, allowing some of the best of the best of his empire to go back to Judea and to rebuild the wall around the city of Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple for their God. The first wave went with a great deal of supplies and wealth that were given to them by uh, that king and by the people of their country. And many Jews that were not going to make the trip also gave supplies. And so we're at a time when the, the wall has been built and the temple has been built. And Ezra goes with a party of a large number of people to take more gold and silver to, um, to, to finish out the ornateness of the temple. And he is sent because he was considered a great teacher of the law. And so not only to prepare a place, but to prepare a people to understand the way of God and to understand the need to live in God's way. And what is reported to him causes him to, to tear his clothing and to, uh, to pray a prayer of repentance that's actually a very poetic and, and touching prayer that we have here. And I want to emphasize that there in the first verse of chapter 9, we see what is the core of the problem. And the core of the problem is the people of Israel, including the priests and Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable ways. And we see that immediately a list of ites a list of nation, uh, king, kingdoms there that were in the land that God had rejected, that were, were clearly understood to be people who had detestable ways. And the reason they were rejected had nothing to do with their DNA. It had to do with their practices, the culture that they had created for themselves. Canaanites, Hittites, per Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. These names would be familiar to you, having read uh, the, the stories of Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and, and, and in there where, where we see that God is displacing these kingdom nations of people and moving them out of the way, sometimes by utter destruction, sometimes just by being conquered and they run away or they become servants and eventually merge into the Jewish faith, the way of God. But the problem is that God had given instructions about the detestable ways uh, before the people were ever guided in by God following Moses. And at the time, it was the problem. Before the overthrow of Judah and the destroying of Jerusalem and the temple, um, the reason that took place is because the people of God had been adapting the ways of those who lived around them, that which they were warned not to do. And that was the reason for the... the the ten tribes to the north having been just totally lost as they were dispersed to other kingdoms uh, far to the north and to the west and spread out across the face of the earth. And all you had left was Judah and Benjamin and of those two tribes. Now Judah had been overthrown. And so they were gone for uh, seven decades into captivity and slavery and then finally sent back to rebuild Jerusalem, a wall around the city and a temple. And Ezra is there to celebrate that and to teach them the, the fine parts of the law and the understanding so that they might be able to live the way they should. And what does he find is that they've taken on the practices of the people 
there that lived around them that God had told them were detestable to him. Verse 2, they have taken on some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. Now that part, I think, leads a lot of people to think that it's a statement about racial separation. I know that in, in, in modern culture that that has been really stressed, that it was a, uh, a racial separation and, and uh, don't mix the DNA aspect of it. Um, but there's a couple of reasons that I want to point out. That here in verse 1, it's the detestable practices that are the problem. And then again in verse 11. For we have forsaken the commands you have given through your servants, the prophets, when they said the land you are entering to, to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its people, by their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. It is the practices of the culture that is the problem. Now, it is mentioning the marrying of their sons, themselves and their sons to the daughters of the people of the land. And later on, it's mentioned again uh, that, 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 that the women were also marrying the men that were introducing these practices. The problem is, is transmitted through that marriage in that if you have one of the partners of the, the marriage, that partner is going to draw the other away from God's way. Jesus said it in the way of saying, do not be unequally yoked. In marriage, don't, don't marry someone who has the different belief foundation and is going to be living in different practices because it's like yoking two oxen together that have different strengths. One is going to be pulling against the other, and they're both going to be rubbed raw, and it won't be a good team, and it won't work well. It doesn't have anything to do with race. In fact, the Bible doesn't break us down into different races, and, and in fact, science doesn't have many races of human beings. It is the one race, the human race. One race that is the human race. But there are different cultures with different practices. And what God makes a distinction of is those practices. And so the problem is, you've been brought back, you've built a temple for your God, you've built a wall around the city of Jerusalem, uh, you're here to worship the God that we taught Nebuchadnezzar about, and, uh, and, and, the, and the other uh, the people there of their place. And we're here to worship him and to live a life in his way, and you've taken on the way of the world, not the way of God. That's the problem. Now I want to address the words that here about uh, have mingled, let's see, about the marriage, taking, taking their sons, and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. Um, I, I was thinking, when I was reviewing this and, and working on this, it seems like the wording is different. So I checked several different translations. New International Version is one of my favorite translations. I use it most of the time because when it's read aloud or silently, it is so close to the way that we think English. And so the flow of it is helpful for that. But when I'm going to be studying, I look at other translations, and there's a reason. Translating from Hebrew or Greek into English, um, one word can be a whole phrase in meaning. And in the English, we really need lots of words sometimes to, uh, to get the clear picture. And at some point, it gets a bit laborious. But I looked at the King James Version. Always go back to that because so many people, that was their, their first experience of being in English. I looked also at the American Standard Version and New American Standard Version because uh, they consciously go ahead and use more English words to translate a Hebrew or Greek word so you can get more of the nuances. And I went to the Evangelical Heritage Version just because it had the word evangelical in it. 
all three of those, um, instead of saying the holy race, it is interpreted more literally the holy seed. They have taken some of their daughters and wives, as wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. Well, the holy seed have mingled the holy seed with those around them. That's more significant. God created the people uh, for, through Abraham and his descendants to be a people of God a nation of, of holy priesthood uh, to, to bring God's light into the world. And we have Jesus uses several images of scattering seed and the seed growing. God has the people that he has created who are going to follow in his specific way doing his practices rather than the practices of the world. And Instead of being the holy seed, they are corrupting the seed. Brings to mind Jesus' parable of the sowing of the, the tares among the wheat. Do you remember that parable? A man went out to sow and he sowed the seed and, uh, and it grew. And, and when it finally came to maturity, they could see, oh no, the tares, there's tares growing, there's weeds growing in amongst the wheat. In fact, when visiting in Jerusalem, I mean in, in Israel, as we're driving along, our guide in the bus said, look out across the field. See how part of the field is green. This is um, wheat fields. And see how it's green. But part of it is, is dark and turning brown. And he said, there's the difference between the wheat and the tares. And so... The, the problem is that God is intending his people to be a holy seed, to be scattered and to grow and to spread all over. But they've gone back to mixing in the ways of the people who are like weeds. It's not a DNA, it's the practices. So in verse 8, But now for a brief moment the Lord our God has been gracious and lifted leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a light, a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. <coughs> he has shown us kindness in his sight and in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its way. Relief from the bondage, which takes us back to the, the passage in Luke. A woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. I love that example, or right, the choice of words that Jesus has here. You are set free from your infirmity. <laughs> then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. She set free from her infirmity. For 18 years, she was crippled by what? A spirit. So Jesus, uh, Luke is telling us about this event, and the, the description here is that it, it's not just a physical ailment that there is a spirit involved. And by what's going on, it is an evil spirit, though not specifically said, but this spirit has crippled her for 18 years. And when, and when Jesus saw her, he called her forward. So she was sitting back there somewhere, and he called her up to the front. Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And then he did something wonderful. He put his hand on her. I don't know if it was on her head or shoulder or if he took her by her face, but he put his hand on her.
And she straightened up immediately and praised God. Now, the leader of the synagogue was incensed. And uh, he was bothered that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And so he said to the people, I think that's significant. He didn't say this to Jesus. So it's kind of a backhanded approach. He's been a bit passive aggressive. He turns to the people in his charge in the synagogue and he says three there are six days for work so come and be healed on those days not on the sabbath now there's no indication here that the woman had come to be healed she wasn't right up front nobody lowered her through the ceiling uh, you know she was there in the crowd and if she'd been there to be healed and any of the other days that she's been there in these past 18 years, there was the opportunity for her to be healed. I would expect she really is not expecting to ever be healed after 18 years. But she's there being taught. She didn't ask Jesus for anything. He sees her and calls her up, and he heals her. So why did Jesus do this on the Sabbath? You know, Jesus could have waited until the end of the service and uh, gone to see her and talk with her for a while. He could have done it not in front of everyone, but he did it in front of everyone, and I think most importantly so that he would be able to have this conflict and address the problem. He could have waited just a few hours, and at sunset it would no longer be the Sabbath. As soon as the sun set, it would be the first day. And Jesus could have healed her then. But he chose to heal her at that moment. What difference would a few hours have made after, six, after 18 years? So the conflict is created and the, and the leader of the synagogue decides to chastise the people. To not say anything against Jesus because clearly Jesus has become very popular. And he puts the blame on the woman. And Jesus doesn't like that. You hypocrites. Now he may have said it along the lines of, You hypocrites! Or he may have, you may have seen in his, demean, uh, his demeanor a sense of uh, a heartbreak. And he may have said, You hypocrites. And it's been my experience that sometimes I, my, my response is, I'm angry about this. And other times my response is, oh, how can you not see? How can you not understand? So I don't know which way it is. I think sometimes it's helpful to me to imagine both ways. But he says, you hypocrites, don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey? And lead it from the stall out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath from that which bound her? I think it is for us to ask, what is binding me? I believe in the church, it's my observation that in the church, we tend to ask often about healing. We, we ask for healing of the physical ailments for others, for ourselves. For people all over the world that are suffering, and that makes sense. We see clearly that Jesus has compassion on people who are suffering. Even when he was in Nazareth and, and their, their disbelief was so great, he, did, he didn't do any miraculous healings, but he did set some people free from demons. But the, no healings because of their lack of faith, we're told. Jesus sets her free on the Sabbath. And he does so so that it can be seen. 
You see, the Pharisees have had so many years of trying to answer people's questions of, well, how much is too much on the, on the rules and regulations and, and taking, do not work on the Sabbath. Well, is it working to do this? Is it working to do that? What about this? Can I do a little bit of walking? Can, and I, as a result, over many years, they, they had minutia in their man's law on what's right and wrong for the Sabbath. And to the point where there was a complete lack of understanding about something such as setting this woman free from the bondage that she's been in for 18 years. When Jesus' opponents uh, saw what Jesus did and heard what he said, they were humiliated. But all the people were delighted with all the wonderful things that he was doing. What do you need to be set free from? What is the bondage? Maybe there's some physical bondage that you need help with. But what about some spiritual bondage? Bitterness or anger from something from the past? Disappointment? about things not going our way. Struggles over various things in relationships with other people or in decisions about do we go north or do we go south. What, what is some bondage in your life? Today is a day to consider, this week is a week to consider Asking the Lord, what ties me down? What holds me back? Am I not bold enough in proclaiming the word and speaking the name of Jesus? Do I think too little of myself and as a result too little of God that I don't think he can use me? Am I limiting what I would be as a son or daughter of God? Because who I've been in the past. In what ways are you bound? It's time for us to ask God for deliverance. It's time for us to receive Jesus' offer. To be made whole and to be set free. And to follow in God's way. To turn away from the ways of the world that obstruct us. And to his way that brings redeeming love. Amen. Number 665. Please stand.